class. There we go. Okay, welcome. We are five minutes over seven. So let's start off with uh, this worked quite well last night. If there's any specific questions, uh, either exam related, um, there is no NQF2 or NQF4 uh, online exam. So everybody would be writing a written exam. And if there's any uh, exam related questions that I can uh, answer, and if there is then any specific topics that you want me to cover. So if we can put that into chat, um, then I'll go through it. And if I need to speak to you, I'll just ask you to please um, uh, put your audio on. So let's give it a, a minute or two. I'm putting chat on now. Some more people that is coming in. This thing drives me insane. There we go. Okay, chat is on. For those that just joined, um, welcome. And uh, if you guys have any exam related questions uh, or any specific topic that you would like me to cover first. Then you can just type it into chat. And then we can take it from there. Okay, it doesn't look like there's anything. So what do you guys want me to do for you then? Any questions, please, so we can have a starting point. Just a question regarding the um, the drawings. Are we, are we going to label them or draw them specifically? If I'm thinking back on previous exams, remember, uh, I have absolutely no clue what your exam is going to look like. Otherwise, this would be unfair. Um, but if I think back on previous exams, they mainly give you drawings. And with the NQF4 paper, it's more of a discussion with regards to the drawing than with the NQF2 that was more labeling uh, or let's say, for example, the Southern Cross indicate how you would find true south, that type of thing. Uh, with the NQF4, there's more discussions involved. So remember with the NQF4, that's why you need to have a minimum of 260 days uh, of experience is through the paper, try and draw from your experience, whether it's 260 days or more, uh, draw from your experience and try and answer the questions with regards to your experience. So when they say explain, uh, for example, they give you a drawing of the uh, water cycle, for example, <clears throat> excuse me. And they say something like, uh, explain your understanding of the drawing above. Then obviously they are, and, and let's say it's for six marks. Um, there's obviously six points that you need to cover there, but try and show your understanding of the water cycle and not just the knowledge from the book. Do you understand what I mean? Yes. So you can, uh, you can expect more that type of questions than okay. uh, a, a typically label the fish, something like that. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure. Mm. Okay, guys, you're going to have to talk to me. Okay, um, so I've got a question. I haven't guided for 260 days. I've only guided for maybe four months. I only got my NQ2 at the beginning of this year. Um, okay. But I have gone and done a whole lot of research on everything. Would that okay. be okay for me to then write this exam? Okay, have your logbook been signed off by Fugasa? 
Uh, no, I'm still filling in my logbook. Okay. Are you registered for the exam now? Sorry, I'm yeah. just admitting someone. Are you registered for that exam? Yes, I've registered for Saturday. Yeah. That's quite interesting because to be able to write the NQF4 exam, the field guide exam, your logbook needs to be signed off. Uh, did you get permission from anybody to, to write the exam or did you just pay for it and register? Well, I spoke to people from Fogasa because I was having problems with um, actually booking the exam. So I forgot yeah. to book it for me. And I had explained this whole situation to them. And then they booked it for me and they said, no, it's fine. I just have to, for the practical, I can only do it next year. Okay. Okay. So you did get permission. So that's, yeah, then that's fine. Um, well, then with the, with the bit of, of experience that you have, just try and bring that into your um, exam answers. Okay. Um, okay. I have gone and done further research and read articles and things like that. So will that okay. help? Yeah, definitely. Any type okay. of research and experience is never wasted. Okay. Okay. Uh, Thank I've got you. a couple. It's a pleasure. I've got a couple of questions here. Good evening. What is expected regarding the new sections, mollusca segmented worms? Do we need to know individual species or families? Okay, so uh, there's two papers. There is, until the end of the year, there is the paper uh, for the old manuals, and then there's the paper for the new manuals. I'm just admitting someone. Here we go. So, um, the, for the new papers, I have not actually seen a lot of the new papers, but let me just read your question. Do we need to know individual species or families? Um, generally, within the NQF4 uh, questions, they do expect you to be able to relate to a certain subject species as example. So I would presume that you will get that as well uh, in, the new, in the new paper. Sorry, there's just a lot of people still coming in. Um, where families are, where, where species, I would say something like within segmented worms, uh, mm. where you would, more relate to families rather than specific species, I would say it would be relevant there then. But I would, if I'm learning something, uh, the different reproductive um, uh, methods, and there's maybe different ones, and you can uh, mention different families or different species that are within the manual, uh, I would definitely take note of that as well for exam purposes. That is for Chris. I hope that helps a bit. Uh, Jacques. Um, yeah, um, guys, I'm Letitia, I'm not Michelle. <laughs> I'm not the MD of Fogasa. Um, I'm just another... Guys, please mute. Thank you. Um, I'm just using Fogasa's logging uh, because I don't have a Zoom account. Um, yes, uh, Jacques, you are recorded as I'm speaking here. I did mention that in the beginning. This is just so that everybody can have uh, equal chance. So it's going to go onto the Fogasa, a link onto the Fogasa page on Facebook. So those that could not make tonight can go and listen to this. Uh, TK Quinn, uh, no problem there. Okay, Nolene, I think we spoke about that now. How long is the exam in duration? Um, I think it's three hours. Actually, that is in that that is for professional. Uh, let me just check. I'll come back to you on that one. Um, 
from the second workbook, older workbook, what can be expected to find in the exam? Can you just give me some background there, uh, Danica, on what the second workbook is about? Remember, it's been years since I've seen <laughs> the, um, the workbooks to fill it in myself. If you can just give me an idea of what the second workbook is about, then I can tell you. Okay, I have a hand up from Solo. You can speak. Solo or Solo. Okay, doesn't sound like that. Uh, in uh, Nolene. Okay, so the second workbook is about South African general knowledge, care for customers, safety and emergency, and conducting guided tour activities. Uh, conducting, guiding? Tour activities. Tour activities. Um, a lot of that is actually electives um, that, that is needed for NQF4. Uh, so there's not really exam questions with regards to that. Perfect. So the exam questions are coming directly from that learner manual. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Anybody else with questions? Okay, Millie, for the section on bacteria, viruses, and uh, Okay, there's a lot of things coming through now. Let me just get back to Millie. Uh, animal diseases, how much do we need to know about each individual animal disease? Um, I would say you, you, you need at least a good general knowledge with regards to the animal diseases. Uh, but then I would concentrate a bit on the ones that are relevant to uh, livestock and the economy. I hope that helps a bit. So some, uh, something that, that would directly influence, say the guiding, the, 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 the guiding sector and the tourism sector, those type of things. So let's say, for example, foot and mouth disease do not actually affect buffalo although they're carriers of it, but it has a direct economic impact uh, on South Africa because our beef are not allowed to be exported if um, foot and mouth disease is found within domestic cattle. So I would definitely know a bit more about foot and mouth disease. So if there's um, what causes it, would... Uh, it, it would be more of a discussion type of, of, of question, I would presume. Um, so what causes it? What type of symptoms can you get? Is there different uh, variants of it? Uh, what impact does it have, uh, say, on the population of the animals itself? Um, and does it have any other effects like economic impact on the country? Things like that. Does that help, Millie? Jacques, the cultural guiding section, would it play a huge part of the exam? No, it would not, to my knowledge. The manual itself and then um, workbook one would be important for exam purposes. Daniel? For the carbon and nitrogen cycle, do we need to draw out the cycle or only explain it in writing? Not too strong in those two concepts. Okay. Um, would you, Daniel, would you like me to explain the carbon and nitrogen cycle to you? Um, or just a question with regards to should you draw it or just explain it? If you can just give me an indication there. 
Um, to answer that question, um, neither the nitrogen or the carbon cycle is very complicated to draw. Um, but again, I would uh, believe that they would rather give you the cycle unlabeled and you need to then explain what is the cycle and uh, your understanding of what, what does the cycle actually entail. So just give me an indication if you would like me to explain those two cycles as well. Uh, okay, then JJ, can you please go through the nitrogen cycle? Okay, I will do that. Uh, okay, Daniel. Okay, let's start with the nitrogen cycle. Um, so nitrogen is freely available. Uh, uh, the uh, symbol for it is N2. So that is freely available in uh, the atmosphere. And you also find it in, uh, in the soil. Okay, so it dissipates into the soil. And nitrogen is uh, essential for life, for any living organism. Nitrogen is essential, but nitrogen, you, you know, we, we can't inhale nitrogen and our bodies can actually uh, then use it for our life functions. So nitrogen needs to be fixed. So there's two parts here. You get nitrification and denitrification. So let's first uh, talk about nitrification. This is when nitrogen N2 is fixed into nitrate as the final product. So the final product is then absorbed by plants. Uh, your consumers then feed on the plant. Uh, so the plant is getting nit uh, nitrogen in through nitrate. Um, and your consumers are getting nitrogen or, um, in as also an, an organic form by feeding on the plants. So nitrification can take place in two ways. Um, you get lightning that will directly change your uh, uh, nitrogen into a nitrate, which can then be absorbed. So every time you see lightning, give it a thumbs up. It's awesome because nitrate, as soon as that lightning hits the ground, nitrate is fixed and the plants can directly uh, absorb that. Then there's the second uh, uh, form of nitrification that can take place, and that is through bacteria, rhizobium bacteria, uh, that you find on certain plants, like for example, acacias. I know the name of Jane, Senegalia and Vitellias, but uh, please don't stone me for still using my favorite genus, acacia. Um, on the root nodes, you do find this bacteria and you get the two nitrifications that take place. So nitrogen being fixed into nitrate and then nitrate being fixed into nitrate. Okay, nitrate is actually quite toxic. Um, for example, if it is fixed in the water and there's a, a high level of nitrate uh, in the water, your fish will die for example. So it needs to go through the process of nitrogen to nitrate, from nitrate to nitrate, which can now be absorbed by the plants, okay? And then the cycle continues. But you can see that in the cycle, uh, nitrogen itself is being fixed into an organic form, which can then be used. So if there, if there is no denitrification that takes place, we can actually deplete the nitrogen uh, in the soil and in the atmosphere. So denitrification needs to take place and that mainly takes place within the oceans. So uh, the oceans then release nitrogen into back into the atmosphere and that completes the cycle. Okay, so that is your uh, nitrogen cycle. Is, was that clear enough? So if you need to draw it, for example, I will have N2 in the atmosphere, maybe have a tree somewhere, um, put some N2 into the soil as well, draw some roots for a plant, 
um, show some bacteria around the plant uh, root hairs, although I don't really think that they will expect you to draw this, but just to give you a picture. So now you have everything in place. I have nitrogen in the atmosphere of nitrogen in the soil. I have my plant, then maybe have a lightning strike then write down there that denitrification to, or, oh, sorry, uh, nitrification took place. Nitrification just means the fixing of nitrogen uh, from N2 to nitrate. Then you can have some uh, funny looking bacteria. You can say the first nitrification that takes place is nit uh, nitrogen to nitrate. Another little funny looking bacteria that takes the nitrate, changes it uh, or fixes it into nitrate. Plants absorb it, have a giraffe eating the tree. And that part of the nitrification cycle is then uh, complete. Then you have a little arm that goes out to denitrification so that we can put nitrogen back into the atmosphere. Uh, draw a few waves and show a little arrow that denitrification taking place with nitrogen going back into the atmosphere. Okay, are you guys happy with that explanation? Is that a bit more clear? I see at least one person uh, nodding their head <laughs> and a, th a few thumbs up, thank you. Um, okay, then with regards to the carbon cycle, the carbon cycle is actually quite a short little cycle. We know that carbon is part of uh, photosynthesis. So let's start with the cycle there. Carbon is absorbed into the plant um, because uh, we need carbon to form our starch and sugars. Um, so uh, carbon dioxide is absorbed into the plant. The molecule is broken. The carbon is now used for the starch. And our um, uh, um, uh, oxygen is released as a byproduct. Okay. Now, so in photosynthesis, carbon, uh, co uh, carbon dioxide is uh, absorbed. That's where our carbon is going. Um, and then, uh, so you can have a little leaf there or a tree, and you can show that the carbon dioxide is absorbed. The molecule is split. Carbon is now used in the plant, um, then carbon, uh, carbon dioxide is also uh, released when uh, organisms breathe out. That includes the plant when uh, cell respiration takes place. Then we have carbon dioxide released back into the atmosphere. Another way that that is also happening is uh, through the burning of fossil, fossil fuels, okay? So there we also have carbon dioxide being released into the atmosphere. And that is what is causing this whole problem with global warming and all of that. Um, carbon dioxide, uh, carbon is also not carbon dioxide. We do find it in the soil as well, but carbon itself being stored within the plants. These are, uh, our plants are massive carbon sinks. Um, and also our soils are carbon sinks, okay? Because of all the, the organisms, the living organisms that we find in the soil. So you will, you will just, you, you'll have small little cycles going where uh, carbon is involved in all these cycles. The, the, the burning of fossil fuels, respiration, cell respiration, uh, the respiration of organisms underground, the respiration of the plants, and then also photosynthesis where carbon is taken in. So that completes then the, the carbon cycle. The carbon cycle is small little uh, different cycles that, that are using carbon, either by taking it in, forming it as sink, storing it, or releasing it back into the atmosphere. Okay, so does that help you guys for the carbon cycle? Okay, let me see if there's any new questions. JJ, arthropods with the life cycles more focused on explaining or drawings? 
I would say explaining. The NQF2 paper is more about explaining than drawing than drawing and labeling those type of questions. It's more explaining. Identifying and explaining. So they don't really tell you this is the carbon cycle explained. They, um, sorry, let me just admit this person. Um, they are more asking you to identify, say for example, the carbon cycle and then explaining that. Uh, Maurice, you can talk. Evening, how are you? I'm very well in yourself. Good, thank you. Um, so uh, just my primary question is, does the majority of the questions, I understand that we need to explain a lot, but are the questions going to be relevant to what's in the manual or is it better uh, the workbook or the manual? The manual. So the manual, so the learner manual itself? Yes. Okay, Definitely. so that's more pertinent. The workbook is not, so if we know the uh, workbook, it's not going to happen. About 30% of the questions will come out of the workbook. Okay. No, okay. Awesome. Um, but the manual, most certainly. Okay. Okay. Hundreds. Yeah, no, perfect. Thank no you. Problem. Pleasure. Okay. Anything else, guys? With, um, I'm just going to, okay, wait, there's a question. Have there been many fish-related questions in previous papers? Yes, they have. There's a whole section about fish, Nolene. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And also from an understanding point of view. Um, so, uh, how, how does fish fit into an aquatic environment? And uh, what is... That. That part of it. That part of it makes total sense to me. And I mean, I could probably go a whole a whole game drive using some fish stuff. But you know, the the literal zones and all those zones and it's like literally zone central with the fish. And I mean, most of the time when you're on a normal game drive, you don't even see a fish. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you don't see a fish, but we do know that the dams have fish in it. And that is what makes it um, quite important to, to learn about fish, to see how you can incorporate that into your game drive. So, you know, you have, for example, a gray heron on the edge of the dam, feeding or standing there, uh, a, a spoonbill filtering through the water. And, you know, that gives you the opportunity to talk about the fish as well. So, um, and then you can bring in the, um, the, the different zones and uh, explain to people uh, the importance of the different zones and why you're not going to find the uh, spoonbill in the deepest part of the water, um, but you might have uh, the, the dab chick or what is it called now, little greed, uh, more to the to the deeper parts of the water because they can dive and go and catch fish and the poor spoonbill or the gray heron will probably drown. So, um, you know, you can always use those type of things to also bring in fish. But yeah, your, um, uh, your different uh, uh, zones within the water and what type of life do you find there and why is quite important. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, pleasure. Uh, when, it, when, when it comes to fish, things like respiration, uh, diffusion, and uh, os uh, osmosis, um, how, do, how do fish breathe? Um, how, how does the oxygen uh, um, go into the blood of, of the fish, and how is the carbon dioxide released? Uh, the function of the swim bladder, the functions of the lateral line. Um, how do uh, uh, marine fish handle salt, salt intake or salt imbalance? Those are quite important things. 
Uh, let me just see. There's a question here. Uh, Chris, do we need to go through NQF2 books again? Uh, the NQF2 is a very, very good foundation that allows you to now build your house on, uh, your house of experience on. So if you did the NQF2 exam many, many years ago, Chris, I have no idea when you did it. <clears throat> um, I would say probably all your definitions and terminologies would be a great idea to, to maybe just do a bit of a refreshing on that, that you can use it in the explanations for the NQF4 paper. I hope that helps, but it is not a requirement. Uh, Danica, any advice for taxonomy? Will there be scientific? Uh, sorry, my page just jumped. Uh, scientific names are not a massive uh, part of the questions. Um, I would more concentrate on the criteria for taxonomy, uh, understanding, uh, for example, the criteria that animals are being classified on reproduction, body structure, and feeding. Um, so, you know, a, a, a understanding of taxonomy is a bit more important with the NQF4 and not just the definitions like in NQF2. Okay, things like uh, reproduction, the different types of reproduction. Um, and yes, you are going to, you're not going to get only explain this and explain that and write a, a quick. Uh, a short essay on this. Um, somebody's speakers on, please put it off or your mic. Hello, please put it down, mute yourself. Doors are closing. Let me quickly see if I can see who it is. Solomon, I'm muting you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, um, what was I talking about? Uh, examples, uh, uh, um, uh, who asked the question, uh, Danica, um, examples can be, for example, um, on domain levels, for example, uh, give example of the domain uh, uh, um, bacteria, something like that. But then you don't have to go to a very specific um, organism unless you do know it. Then I hope the, the uh, person that marks your paper also knows it. Uh, but things like infectious bacteria such as E. coli, something like that. That would be sufficient. Does that help? I hope so. Uh, Daniel, will there be questions for any of the modules that ask like this? Choose a tortoise in your area and give four facts on the species. I can't tell you there won't be a question like that, but I think that is if it's a four mark question under red tiles, that's going to take quite a lot of marks away from other things that are important within the red tiles. Um, so I, I, maybe two facts or uh, it's half a mark, mark a fact, but to be quite honest with you, I've never seen a question like that in an NQF4 paper. But that does not mean you're not getting that on Saturday. Please don't stone me afterwards if that is a question in the exam. I just haven't seen it before. Okay. Okay. Charmaine, what is meant by retrogressive, uh, sorry, retrogressive succession in plants? Um, okay, so you get um, succession. Under succession, you get. Uh, Guys, will you just excuse me for a second? My sliding doors are open and the wind is starting to blow my furniture around. I'll be back just in a second. Maybe think of some questions. 
I just want to close the door quickly. Okay, there we go. Excuse me. Uh, let me just. Okay, so excuse me. So succession, we get the two uh, two types of succession. I'm just going to cover that uh, just for interest sake, and then get to retrogressive succession. Um, we get primary succession and secondary succession. Primary succession is where there was no plants growing before. There was no vegetation growing before. And now um, you have uh, plants starting to grow or have already established in that area. So let's take, for example, a big granny, uh, granite rock uh, that is cracked. Some soil is formed. Some lichen has uh, started to grow in there. Nutrients are going into that soil. Seeds are collecting in there. And now we start having grass growing. I don't know if you guys have ever been to that massive uh, granite rock there in the Kruger near be, between Skakuza and uh, Pretoria Skop. And you walk there and you get this grass just growing out of the rock. Uh, that would be primary succession, um, where you will have pioneer subclimax and climax, but it started on something where there's never previously been any vegetation. So it's not due to a disturbance. Then secondary succession is due to a disturbance. Let's say a road or old airfield, overgrazing, erosion, those type of things, uh, where it goes through the stages of pioneer, subclimax, and climax uh, due to a disturbance. Retrogression is because of the disturbance in a climax uh, or an established community, plant community, due to overgrazing or due to you taking your vehicle and uh, start driving a road, um, that can then uh, be pushed into a disturbed area um, uh, um, backwards. So it's from climax to pioneer. I hope that helps. Okay, let me see what the other questions is, Maurice. Is there any way to get mock exams to see question examples? No, there is not a possibility. <laughs> um, that is why we're having this, this discussion. So I am trying my utmost best to be fair to everybody writing throughout the country, not to share specific questions with you guys so i'm trying to keep it as as wide open as possible um, otherwise it would be quite unfair to people i would uh, uh maurice if you want to you're more than welcome to contact contact the fogasa office and if they have very old papers that they know you know it's it's gonna not relate to the paper on the 29th they might share it with you i cannot guarantee that but it uh, you know if you don't ask you don't get <laughs> but i will not be able to share any mock exams with you sorry for that okay daniel uh, i'm gonna try my best to pronounce this uh, name narishia i hope that is correct um, do we need to focus on any diagrams for explanation purposes? Yes. Uh, are you talking about something like the cycles, those type of diagrams, maybe a pond and you need to um, uh, indicate the different zones? Yes. 
definitely that. If you mean something else with diagrams, just share that with me and then I have a better understanding uh, how to answer you. Okay, that is all the, the questions and a lot of thank yous. It is a big pleasure, you guys. Uh, you guys are welcome to type some questions. I think what I will just do now, just to give you guys a little bit of peace of mind. That's a, a pleasure, Narishia. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, I'll just go through the different sections and just maybe highlight a few important things and try to give you some way of how questions can be asked without being unfair to people that do not have access to uh, this forum. So if we're going to the guiding, the guiding section, so section one or module one, sorry, I'm just extremely thirsty. I had uh, dinner before this started and I put a bit too much salt on my food. Um, in the um, uh, creating of a guided experience section, um, the old type of questions like uh, what would you check on your vehicle before you go out, obviously they still need to establish that you can remember these things. Um, um, uh, Ru Rushada, I will uh, look at your question just now. Um, and if you've been working for at a minimum of a year, as the requirement is, 260 days, then I'm sure you've done a couple of vehicle checks already. Um, things like briefings, client checks, what things you should have in your, uh, with you, um, those things are still important. But then you can now also start to expect more explanation type of uh, questions like scenarios, giving you a scenario, like let's say, for example, you are gonna go out on a walk. And remember, there's a lot of walk and drive questions here because a lot of people have now already started with their trails guide qualification and are walking. So you can expect driving and walking questions. So please make sure that you read the question don't just give four uh, things that you would think of and then you don't read walk or drive and they are specifying and then you answer it for driving and actually they were asking for a walk. So please make sure that you don't make that mistake because you can have beautiful answers there and if I'm marking your paper, I have to mark it all wrong because you answered the question for something different. Um, but let's say, for example, some... One of your guests, you're going to go out on a walk. One of your guests are wearing a very brightly colored shirt and flip-flops. Um, how would you handle this, uh, this situation in a professional way? Okay. So that's why these type of questions show that you have experience already. Draw from your experience or try, if you haven't been in a situation like that, Try and put yourself in that situation and how would you handle this? Okay. Uh, let me just quickly look at questions and then I'll continue there. Uh, Maurice, that is a big pleasure. Uh, Rashada. Obviously, having an understanding of the whole manual is paramount, but what will you say, in your opinion, is the most important and count the most towards the total? Rashada, everything. <laughs> Sorry to not be able to give you, uh, to give you more detail there, but really everything. I cannot highlight anything. What I will do now is go through sections and try and highlight um, the things that 
are quite prominent in exams without giving away questions. So just maybe stay logged in and um, I, I might be able to shed a bit more light on it. Uh, Andre, what type of questions can we expect regarding the kingdoms and explanation thereof, for example, bacteria, archaea, etc.? That is, it, it's difficult questions there, Andre. Um, again, I can't give away questions. <laughs> um, uh, understanding of kingdoms, uh, understanding of the different kingdoms with examples, if I can give you that uh, as an answer. I hope that helps. Charmaine, what is the ratio between the number of algae and fungi species making up lichens? Oh, you got me on that one. I will get back to you on that. I know that fungi is the bigger part of the relationship. Um, so I would presume more algae to fungi. But I am, I, I will just look that up. Uh, Jacques, a question I always had. Uh, I'm an extremely practical person out there. Does Fugasa expect only the answers as stipulated in the manual or would the accept answers that's almost directed in the same outcome but with different wording and or scenarios. Absolutely, Jacques. Please share your experience with the uh, exam, uh, the person marking your paper. Um, it's, it's far more entertaining, but, and here comes the big but, you have to bring in if it's a four mark question, there's got to be four things in your answer. Uh, it doesn't matter how you are explaining it. But uh, let's say it is how are animals classified? And you give me a, a paragraph on that, but reproduction, body shape, and feeding, obtaining food has to come through in your answer. Okay. Pleasure. Okay, let's continue with section one. So, um, uh, I'm just looking around here and trying to give you guys at least some light on the subject. Open-end questions like, for example, uh, regarding your all-around knowledge. You know, that is a, that is a very open-ended statement to make. Why is your all-around knowledge important as a guide? Explain. There is no real answer there. So they, the answer there must show your experience. Okay, so those type of questions you can, you can also expect. Uh, I hope that is uh, giving you a little bit more information on module one. Let's go to geology. I'm just getting my the the memory going yeah um soils very important for nqf4 please concentrate on soils everything in that manual with regards to soils make yourself a nice summary on that um remember in the nqf2 it was all about the rock types. How are they formed? And then how are they weathered? What is happening to the weathered material? It is eroded. What is the, the difference between weathering and erosion? Now, that weathering process gives us our soils. NQF4 is a lot about soils. Soil ecology. You know, your soil ecosystems. Um, all the uh, how do soils form 
all your different soil uh, or, 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 or the, the soil catena, which you get your A, A zone and then your B and C and D and your parent rock and then the broken parent rock and all of that. Um, terminologies there. Please go and look at the different terminologies that are used there. Um, the, uh, the different characteristics of soil, the different types of soil. So uh, I would definitely take good note of soils in the geology part. And then relating that to plants. Okay. Uh, again, you know, the, in the NQF2, the old thing, you get the rock, the rock weathers down, you get soil, makes different types of soil. Soil gives you different uh, uh, vegetation. Vegetation determines your animals. That is the NQF2 answer. NQF4 answer shows understanding of that. Okay, so how would the different soils influence the plant life? and explain with examples. That is, that is important. Okay. Uh, let me just check if there's any questions so far. No? Okay, astronomy. Your constellations, important stars in those constellations that, 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 that helps you to find those constellations in the night sky. Um, and there's far more constellations in NQF4 than in NQF2. So don't be, I'm not saying don't learn Scorpio, Orion, and Southern Cross. Obviously, yes. But the other, the new ones, know them. Seventh brightest star, 13th brightest star, brightest star in the night sky. And what constellations are they in okay um any stories with regards to constellations okay the old orion and scorpion those type of stories go and look them up don't make up your own story <laughs> I, I, I can't mark your own story right, although it might, it might be entertaining. <laughs> uh, it's always uh, for an examiner, nice to have a good laugh every now and then. Okay. Um, little uh, little one-pointer questions like, what is a blue moon? That can maybe appear somewhere or not. Um, what else can I say about astronomy? Okay, let's move on to weather and climate. In NQF2, a question can come up, what is wind? I don't know if you guys remember that famous question. What is wind? For one mark, it's moving air. In QF4, why does the air move? <laughs> okay. Insight and understanding needs to come in there. Okay. So now you need to start talking about high pressure, low pressure. How does that... Uh, why does the high pressure give make the air move you know so how is wind formed not just what is wind can you guys see how the questions are starting to change from nqf2 to nqf4 okay the coriolis effect oh i get funny answers there <laughs> Please go and read and understand the Coriolis effect. Okay. That is such a nice little subject to ask 
many questions or longer questions, inside questions about. So I'm not going to give you the questions. Go and learn the Coriolis effect. Okay, and how does it affect the major winds? And why does it affect the major winds? Okay. And remember, Mr. Newton, please bring that into your answer. Okay, everybody remember the first law of Mr. Newton. Anything that moves will continue moving unless there's a opposing factor in place. That has to do with the Coriolis effect. Okay, bring that into it. It's a pleasure, Daniel. Have a great evening. Uh, for those that are going to leave soon, um, guys, if there's anything that I can help you with, here's my email address. Info at campfireacademy.co.za. There is my number. 082-372-8751. Okay, pop me a message. I will do my utmost best to try and help you. Okay, WhatsApp or email. Please don't phone me. I'm very busy during the day with uh, lectures and practicals. So uh, please pop me a message. And when I get home at night, I will try and help you as much as possible. Okay, for those that are leaving now. Okay, we back at weather and climate. Um, know your different spheres, uh, um, the different layers of the atmosphere, okay? Um, and know them in order, please. They are based on temperatures, so know them in order. Know a little bit about them. The ozone layer, where do we find the ozone layer and what is the importance of the ozone layer? You need to know in which, uh, um, uh, in which layer of the atmosphere you will find that. Okay. And then explanations of weather in the different areas, either winter or summer. Not just um in on the east we have summer rainfall and on the west we have winter rainfall that's an nqf2 answer nqf4 answer shows why do we get rain in the east and why in summer and why do we get rain um in the west in winter okay go so find out why Go look a bit about um, how to convert degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit. It's a very, very simple calculation. Don't reinvent it. Okay, ecology, all the different cycles, the oxygen cycle, the water cycle, the uh, carbon cycle, the hydro, uh, of the, um, nitrogen cycle know all of them know the the picture in the manual um must be able to identify it must be able to explain it okay no photosynthesis please must be able to explain it with insight not scientifically Okay, don't go and write the entire uh, formula there and don't understand what the formula is about. Go and find it, uh, find out exactly what happens during photosynthesis. Uh, know your functional parts of the ecosystem. If you don't remember it, please go and look in your NQF2 manual. Sorry, and let me just read you quickly. What about the Beaufort wind scale? Do we need to know the table from the manual? <laughs> yes. 
Yes, Charmaine, sorry for the bad news. I have seen questions with regards to it, you know, if the tree leaves are just moving on the Beaufort wind scale, what does that mean? Yes, please know it. Um, where was I? Okay, your functional parts of the ecosystem, things like, for example, limiting factors. So they're not going to ask you name the three functional parts of an ecosystem. That's the NQF2 question. NQF4 is they'll take one of it and uh, you must explain, for example, sorry, let me just admit Andre. Um, you have to explain, for example, how fire is a limiting factor in an ecosystem, that type of question. Okay, somebody's, uh, somebody's not muted. Andre, maybe you, welcome. Sorry, you just had the uh, power failure again. Sorry, I'm back. <laughs> uh, no problem. <laughs> okay. Um, give you another uh, type of way that you must think of learning the NQF2. I hope this is not scaring you guys. Honestly, um, the NQF2 paper is actually a very nice paper. It is, you can really express yourself in the NQF2 paper. Don't be scared of it. I know it's a lot of work to learn, but if you've been, <laughs> Charmaine, please don't be scared to death. <laughs> Share your fear with me in an email or a WhatsApp and I'll see if I can calm it down for you. Um, it is really a nice paper. If you think of your NQF2 paper, it was a lot of definitions and terminologies and relationships and, uh, you know, very point form type of questions that you needed to answer. Now that you're writing the NQF4, you've got some experience to back that up. You, you should have developed an understanding of ecology, for example and draw from that. When you're learning these things, except for things like the Coriolis effect, well, actually you can understand that as well. To be honest with you guys, I'm a very visual person. Um, earlier, somebody also said that. Um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a bookworm. Uh, so I literally go onto Google and I type in Coriolis effect for kids, animation. <laughs> and voila I can I understand it now so um, go and do those type of things uh, go look for examples uh, learning has become extremely easy with the internet uh, take uh, type in explain how fire is a limiting factor in the ecosystem and then maybe say animation and you'll be amazed with what you come, what comes up on the internet. But please just, uh, just go back to the manual and make sure that you are looking at a kid's animation <laughs> that is related to the facts that you should bring into your answer as well. Okay. Um, but the NKF2 paper, I hope this inspires you guys, is really... It's a nice paper. You can express yourself and not just write down, uh, I always call it parrot answers. You know, if you tell a parrot every morning, if you say to a parrot every morning, hello, hello, Pity, hello, Pity, hello, Pity. Now, after a week, the parrot says, hello, Pity, when he sees you. Uh, that's not an NQF4 uh, answer. Okay. Why is the parrot saying hello, pity every morning? <laughs> Explain that. That's the NQF4 answer. Uh, let me quickly, Marty, do you mean NQF2 or NQF4? Uh, I probably made a mistake there. Everything is about NQF4. Sorry, Marty. Or, yeah, Marty. Um, where were we? With ecology. Okay, um, 
um, back to fire, for example, how would uh, how would uh, fire influence other spheres? You guys know we get the different spheres: your lithosphere, your pedosphere, your chrysosphere, uh, biosphere, atmosphere, hydrosphere. So let's say there's a fire, uh, a bushfire. How does that influence the other spheres? Uh, again, these things are quite logical, especially if you've been in the bush. Only, if it's only been for a, uh, for a year, put yourself in the bush. Light a fire, I don't mean that physically, please, in your mind, okay? <laughs> Light a fire and watch the bush burn. What does it influence? It's burning grass. It's popping uh, the moth eggs. Uh, it's popping the, the, uh, the ticks. The bird's nest sets on fire. So it has a, a, a massive influence on the biosphere, the living part. But that fire is also warming up the soil. So the pedosphere is also influenced. And everything that lives inside the pedosphere, the temperature of the soil is rising. That has an influence on the plant's root systems as well. Uh, Shomain, I'll answer that for you now. Um, so that has an influence on your pedosphere, okay? Your soil. Uh, ashes and stuff that is blown uh, ends up in the water. That makes the water murky. It has an influence on fish vision, for example, okay? The smoke that goes up into the air uh, has an uh, uh, influence on the atmosphere, the visibility in the atmosphere, and also if, say, some plastics and things and tires and things are now also burning due to this bushfire, pollutants that are released into the atmosphere. Can you guys see how a bushfire has a, a ripple effect into the other spheres and not just the biosphere? Okay, those type of insight, but really, Create scenarios for yourself that can help you explain what you are learning. And then answer your questions around that. It's much easier. That's just the way I learn. Okay, if that doesn't work for you, forget everything I just said. <laughs> uh, okay, Charmaine, what is an example of a fundamental niche and a realized niche? Okay. So a fundamental niche is, how can I explain that? Let's take a tree and let's take birds, okay? Um, uh, let's say we have some, let's have a big tree where we have a secretary bird that will have its nest, a big platform nest on the top of the tree. And on the lower branches of the tree, we have uh, our lesser mask weavers having their little nests. Okay, so let's just have that picture in our mind now. The fundamental niche for these birds is the tree. It can utilize the, in, the entire tree, okay? The, the uh, mask weavers can can hang their nests at right at the top of the tree if they want to. They can utilize the entire tree. That would be the fundamental niche. Okay, so in this case, I'm explaining nesting behavior. Okay, so the fundamental niche for the nesting behavior of birds is a tree. Okay, they can utilize the entire tree. The realized niche is for the secretary bird, they prefer the top of the tree where they can make a large platform nest because they're big birds, they have big chicks, 
the cheeks are quite active and they move around. And so mommy and daddy is making massive nests for them. The realized niche for uh, the lesser mast weavers is the hanging branches at the uh, more at the bottom part of the tree because that allows them to escape uh, uh, potential predators to actually get to their nests. Does that help you a bit, Shemaine? So the realized niche is what, what part of the fundamental niche uh, will be applicable to that species or those groups of, of organisms. Okay, I see Nolene gave me a thumbs up. Shamain, if you can let me know if that helps you. Uh, that is a big pleasure. As you guys can see, I make pictures in my mind the whole time, and that has really helped me to learn. Okay. Uh, unless there's some other questions. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how other people can just learn words. Words don't mean a lot to me. Okay. Taxonomy. I already spoke a little bit about taxonomy. So um, please know what is a prokaryote and a eukaryote. Okay. Uh, botany. Okay, canobacteria and eubacteria and archaea bacteria. Please understand, learn those things. Okay, go look them up on Google. Know what they look like. If you have a picture of something in your mind, you remember it better, or at least me and Nolene. <laughs> and hopefully a few others of you. Um, know those what is their purpose in an ecosystem um uh, Rishada, yes shelford's law limiting factor uh, of niches yes definitely um okay c3 and c4 photosynthesis Really, guys, there is amazing, absolutely amazing explanations on the internet. From animation to scientific. <laughs> Go and look that up. It is how carbon is fixed. Okay. I'm going to give you a, a very, very, very elementary explanation quickly. But please go and read up more about it. But hopefully it will give you a starting point to understand it. C3 means three carbons. C4 means four carbons. Okay, that's where the two words come from. Now, if you have uh, uh, the plant cells, there's a stomata. Stomata is a window or a door. It's a thing that opens and closes. Okay. Um, and this is where carbon dioxide is taken into the plant. With C3, carbon dioxide is taken in when the stomata is open. Okay. Oxygen is released when the stomata is open. Nothing happens when the stomata is closed. For example, some plants close their stomata at night. Okay? Or if there is a lot of uh, um, a lot of heat, they will close that because remember the other byproduct of photosynthesis is water loss. Okay. So when the stomata is open, water can, can uh, get lost through the stomata and the plant can actually dehydrate. So your C3 plants, the uh, photosynthesis, the, the release of oxygen and water and the uptake of carbon dioxide takes place. Uh, uh, Marty, I will just look at your question just now. Um, Sorry, you're just saying thank you, I think. Greatly appreciate it. Okay, good luck, Marty. Let me know if I can help you with anything, okay? 
So when this tomato is open, everything takes place. When this tomato closes, this is to help to protect the plant or at night. With C4 plants, there's an additional cycle that takes place even if the stomata is closed. Okay. So photosynthesis can continue even when the stomata is closed. So I hope that gives you something to work from, but please go and look at some animations. There's excellent explanations on the internet with regards to C3 and C4 photosynthesis. And this will also help you understand why these grasses prefer certain areas to grow and why these grasses uh, would be for that specific areas more palatable. The moment you understand that, the rest all will start to make sense. Okay. But I hope that very elementary explanation at least gives you a starting point for understanding that. Okay, relationships are, oh, sorry, now I'm not thinking of ecology again. The flower. The flower, please go and learn the flower. Uh, thinking back, I've told you guys there's not, I didn't say there's no labeling. <laughs> I said there's not a lot of labeling. This is one of those, those labeling questions. Okay, this picture of a flower leads itself to labeling questions. Okay, so which are male, which are female, those type of things. Okay. Arthropoda, it's a pleasure, Charmaine. Okay. Please go and look at your insects, uh, the different ones with the wings, the external wings and incomplete metamorphosis, all primitive. Wingless insects that undergo little or no metamorphosis, those type of things, your exothery goats and your endothery goats. I don't know if I'm pronouncing these words right. Um, but those type of things, please go and have a look at that. Um, if in your manual, um, they talk about a very specific organism, and they give you a lot of information with regards to that organism. Learn that. Okay. I'm not going to give examples here because then I give questions away. But go through your manual. So they, they, they talk about arthropods or they talk about insects. And then they say, the. let me just draw one from the hat. The net wing beetle okay and then they give you a lot of information about the net wing beetle that's not in the manual okay please that is not a question in the exam hope hope not <laughs> um take note of those things you can get questions with regards to that okay Uh, that more or less cover uh, Charmaine. Uh, I don't know if you came in maybe a little bit later. Uh, the I think there's only been two papers on the new manual so far, if I am correct. So I am not 100% up to date with the questions in the new manual with the new papers, okay? Um, I'll, uh, Andre, I will look at your question just now. Um, but if they do label a mushroom in the new uh, manual, 
if it is not something like 12 marks, if it's uh, something with regards to maybe different sections, yes, I will have, uh, I would definitely uh, learn that. Okay. Um, Andre, C3 and C4 in grasses relation to C3 and C4 photosynthesis. Can you just quickly explain? Uh, Andre, I just did that. Um, uh, I, I will quickly do that again, uh, but you're welcome. Uh, this whole session is being recorded and it will, there will be a leak on the Fogasa and then you can just maybe go and um, go and listen to that part again. But C3 stands for uh, three carbon and C4 for four carbon. And if we look at the cell, the cells are on a leaf, for example, you get the different cells and then there's a little opening called the stomata. With your C3 plants, the stom when the stomata is open, photosynthesis can take place. When the stomata closes, maybe during the, uh, because of the heat of the day, so that a lot of water loss would not take place, it closes and then photosynthesis don't take place. Where with your C4 plants, even with the stomata closed, uh, closed, you uh, photosynthesis can continue. So please just go and have a look at some, maybe some animations on, on uh, Google, just Google C3, C4 animation, and or uh, if animations is, uh, is not for you, just maybe a video on explanation. They are great material on the internet that explains C3 and C4, but that just gives you an idea of what it's about, okay. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Um, okay, amphibians. Uh, in uh, NQF2, we learned about frog calls. In NQF4, we learn how they make the calls. Okay, quite important. So please uh, look through that, how calls are made. And then um, in the amphibian section, um, it is, uh, uh, again, if they specify certain things like specific frogs and how this frog actually uh, um, uses its toxins or how does this frog handle heat or dehydration or, uh, does it drink water, all those type of things. Take note of those things, okay? Um, where they mention specific species or specific groups, take note of that. They didn't put it in the manual for no reason. They put it in the manual so that you must know it. And they want to know if you know it, okay? Okay, reptiles. Um, remember in NQF2, uh, you would get questions with, res with regards to Salonians and it says, where would you find the tortoise and where would you find the terrapin and where would you find the turtle, okay? NQF4, specifically, where do you find them? There's a table in your books with all the different uh, tortoise, terrapin and turtles. And they tell you where in South Africa you find them. So again, Deeper knowledge and insight, not just fresh water or on land, way on land will you find them, okay? Um, yeah. 
with regards to to reptiles just learn the whole thing <laughs> um snakes what venom do they have and which ones are uh of medical importance and how dangerous is it and what type of venom do they have and where would you find their fangs okay so those type of things there your tortoise terrapin turtles if there's uh names that are similar like the hinged tortoise and the hinged um uh, uh um turtle Where's the hinges? Why, why, why is the name hinged? Because it has a hinge. Where's the hinge? Okay. Is it at the front? Is it at the back? Okay, fish we already covered earlier. So just a quick recap again. Now it's not just name the three regions of a fish. What do you find in those three regions, for example? Okay, where do you get the swim bladder? Where's the lateral line? And then talking about the lateral line and the swim bladder, you must be able to now explain it. Okay, how does the swim bladder work? How does the lateral line work? It's very well explained in the manual. And again, if you don't understand it from the manual because it's just a bunch of words, Google it. Okay. How do fish breathe? Um, how do fish fit into an ecosystem? What is its purposes? Um, uh, what relationships are there within an uh, aquatic ecosystem that involves fish? Osmotic regulation, diffusion, those things, those are all new in NQF4. So uh, please go and, and find out a bit more about it. Birds, migration comes into birds. That's new from or added from NQF2. So migrations are obviously then important. The different types of migrations with examples and where do they go and why do they migrate in nqf2 we learned that birds share with reptiles a cloaca now you need to know how the cloaca uh, or that whole passing of the uric acid how does that take place okay why are birds droppings white the answer is not uric acid not for two or three or four marks okay it's it's two words so i can't even if it's for three marks <laughs> if I was just marking the words, you're still only getting two. Okay, and then the bird's digestive system. That's also new in NQF4. Know the di digestive system of birds. Okay, mammals. Okay, in NQF2, uh, sorry, let me just see the question here. Do we need to know all the bird families or in general be able to classify them? <laughs> uh, a yes and no. How do I answer this question to be fair to everyone? Uh, Concentrate on quite common birds, if I can answer it that way. Okay, and know, know which families they belong to. And I know that we are now talking countrywide. So think of 
countrywide common birds. Okay, they can't just ask fine boss birds because I'm sitting in the savannah and what I know about the fine boss is not too bad, but it's most certainly not to the extent of the savannah. Okay, so concentrate. Remember, this is a countrywide exam. It's not a biome specific exam. Um, so concentrate on birds that you would find countrywide. It's a pleasure, Elena. Um, with regards to digestive systems, in NQF2, it was named the different chambers of a ruminant stomach. NQF4, and then you could put it in any order you want, as long as you just know the different chambers. Rumen, the reticulum, the omasum and the abomasum. Know what happens where, for example, in the rumen, fermentation takes place. Fermentation um, causes the cut to fall. What happens to the cut? Where does it go from there? What happens in the reticulum? What happens in the omasum? What happens in the abomasum? Okay. How does the digestive systems or the, the um, yeah, the digestive systems of, for example, a hindgut fermenter and a ruminant, how does that help yeah. you? Uh, sorry? Sorry, somebody is talking. Are you asking a question? Okay. Um, how does the, the different stomach structures out there assist you as a guide? Can you see the insight? You as a guide uh, to give your guests a better experience. Ruminants, they don't eat 20 to 22 hours a day. During the heat of the day, they go lie in the shade and they regurgitate their food. Um, with the exception to a buffalo. Um, where your hindgut fermenters need to eat a lot. So they're busy the whole day trying to find food. Okay, how does the water requirement, I'm just throwing something else in now, also assist you? Um, which animals, so your experience needs to come in here now. What animals do you see walking around the whole day feeding? So you can get them almost anywhere. Where animals that, uh, that are high, uh, uh, ruminants during the heat of the day, you're going to find them somewhere under a tree. Okay, early mornings, late afternoons, they move more for feeding. So those type of uh, insight questions. Okay, what else? Then general questions, what's the difference between this animal and that animal with regards to their physical appearance? Okay, I'm not going to say which animals, things that look alike. Okay. Um, metabolic, metabolic rate and size of the animal. Go and look a little bit into that. Okay, why does the grasshopper um, or the grasshopper has a higher metabolic rate than that of an elephant, for example? Why? How does it affect the animal? How much do they need to eat and why? Mm. And then in NQ4, they throw in the hippo as well with its full gut fermenter stomach. Go and find out what that means. Okay, animal behavior. Oh, how can I help you with this? I'm thinking of a question now and I don't want to give questions away. So how can I help you with this? Uh, 
the importance of animal behavior. Okay. Um, for the interpretation to your guests. Uh, there are specific aspects that answer your why, who, to whom, who's involved. Those, it, it answers those questions. There are specific aspects that you need to take into consideration uh, when interpreting animal behavior with your guests. Go and, look, go and look at those aspects a bit more and understand them. Okay, there's four of them. Um, so it was in NQ4 vocalization under communication as an animal behavior. Get a, get a deeper understanding of why vocalization is a preferred method of communication. Okay, think of it. Uh, I can sit here and I can talk very softly if I want to, or I can scream and your eardrums wants to burst, so I can control volume. I can also suddenly stop talking, or I can never stop talking. I can also um, uh, give specific, like, uh, hello. And then everybody knows that there's somebody in my house and I'm greeting them. So there's, there's a lot of control when it comes to vocal communication. And that's why animals use it. Yeah, so go, just go and, and understand that use. The, why do animals use vocal communication? Why is it a preferred method of communication? Yeah. Okay, and in, with animal behavior, oof, that's, it's, it's, a, it, it's a section that they, can, that they can ask a lot of questions um, of, for camouflage. With, and examples with, with animal behavior is very, very important. Be able to explain it via an example. And it makes it so much easier to, to answer a question if you, if you can answer it through an example. Uh, I always say, if you don't know how to answer and you, you, you can't find the right words to answer a question, use an example. Ex at least the examiner can then see you understand the concept, the crux of the question. Use an example. And in animal behavior, that is the best way. And in most of the questions, they would be explained by using an example. Okay. So uh, expect that those type of questions in animal behavior. With regards to the new manual, um, I am still going through that manual. If you guys uh, have specific questions with regards to all the new modules in the new manual, please pop me uh, um, a message either on WhatsApp uh, or on email for those that came in later. I will just share that with you again. You have an entire, well, longer than a week. There we go. Info at campfireacademy.co.za is my email. And my telephone number for WhatsApp messages is 082372. 8751. Send me a message and um, I will go through that section and I will, uh, I will try and explain it to you to the best of my knowledge or at least give you a link to maybe a, 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 a video or something on, on the internet that will help to explain it to you. Um, I have not uh, had time to go through that entire manual yet, so I don't know the very specific questions, 
So if you guys have maybe workbook questions or things like that, or there's certain aspects within those modules that you don't understand, please send me the question and I will see how I can help you to the best of my ability. Okay. Uh, I've got some questions or messages here. Any chance we can have a point breakdown per module for the exam? Um, generally between uh, anything from about seven to, to 20 marks per module. Obviously, your bigger modules, botany, mammals, animal behavior, geology, ecology, those big modules, uh, they will carry the most weight. But these um, 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 points per module can change from one paper to another. Okay. Okay, yes, Nolene. Um, yeah, as I say, if you guys have specific questions, please send them through to me. And I have, I have quite a lot of links that I can give you guys to help to understand things like C3, C4, photosynthesis, the water cycle, the nitrogen cycle, um, those type of things. How pollination or fertilization in plants take place, those type of things. I've got quite good links. So the things that you don't understand, um, I will, I'll, I'll give you a short explanation. And if I know of a, a good link, I will put that in the answer for you as well. Okay. Okay, guys, if there's no other questions, um, you guys are welcome to pop in some more. I have the whole night that I can help you guys. Otherwise, if there's nothing else, um, I hope it helped. It's a pleasure, Daniel. It's a pleasure, Chris. TK Quinn. Uh, Nolene. Andre. Oh, any pointers on mollusks? Uh, Andre, please uh, pop me a question on WhatsApp or email. Um, I will go through the manual on mollusks for you and I will sort of think what type of questions uh, can be expected on mollusks. Okay. Uh, big pleasure, Jacques. Bashara, no, I can't read that fast. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to help you guys, and uh, uh, if you need any more help, please just let me know. Okay. Thank you so much. Please. It was a great help. It's a big pleasure. Thank you. Okay, guys, I am going to log out. Please remember the, yes, the recording will be, uh, I don't know if it's going to be on the website. Uh, it will, there will probably be a link on, um, on the Fagasa Facebook page to the recording. Okay. Thank you guys. Have a great evening. Enjoy load shedding. Bye-bye. <laughs>